Hello, and welcome to Messages from the Bowing Place. You know, sometimes words that we use tend to lose their sincerity and their effect on others because of repeated usage. Like, for instance, the words, how are you? I mean, how many times have you said, how are you, to the cashier at the grocery store and many other people, but not really been sincere about it? In fact, it's pretty much a given that when a stranger says, how are you, it's not because they really want to know how you are. It's because they're really just trying to be polite. In this way, the words, how are you, have become more like a greeting as opposed to a genuine question requiring any answer other than the obligatory, fine. So at this point, those words no longer have an effect on people. And so we have become numb to the words, how are you? Because through their repeated usage, we're saying something that unfortunately we do not really mean. And you know what other words we as a nation have grown numb to? The words, in God we trust. Does that phrase sound familiar to you? Well, it should because the phrase, in God we trust, is printed on our money. And not only that, in God we trust has also been the official motto of the United States since 1956. Now, the word trust means to have faith, to believe in, and to rely on. So the motto, in God we trust, implies that our nation's political and economic prosperity is in God's hands because we have faith in, we believe in, and we trust in God for those things. And although the motto, in God we trust, is a beautiful motto, we're saying something that, as a whole nation, we really do not mean. Therefore, the words, in God we trust, just like the words, how are you, no longer have an effect on us because we don't really mean them when we say them. And so even though the beautiful words in God we trust are right in front of our faces every day because they're printed all over our money, for the most part, our nation doesn't even acknowledge God. Therefore, our nation has become numb to the words in God we trust. But you know, when people who don't acknowledge God and are numb to him use the motto, in God we trust, then the words are of no effect in their lives. And while there are many Christians in our nation who do acknowledge and do trust God, our nation as a whole does not trust God. And this is very unfortunate. Because you see, our nation really has to believe in our motto in order for it to work for us. Well, why? Well, because our motto has the word God in it. And it implies that as a nation, we trust God with our political and economic prosperity. So what does this mean for a lukewarm nation who is numb to God, who is spiritually bankrupt, to say that they trust God for their political and economic prosperity. Well, let's just say that since the words in God we trust are printed all over our monetary system, none of us should be surprised if very suddenly our economic and political systems go into cardiac arrest and cannot be resuscitated. Why? Well, because if we look at what the Spirit of God said to the Laodicean church, a church that had grown lukewarm in their faith and zeal for Jesus, it's clear to see that God doesn't like anyone who claims that they have faith in him, who claims that they believe in him, or who claims that they trust him to be lukewarm, or in other words, to be numb to him. Therefore, according to scripture, the Lord's response will be to vomit those who are lukewarm or numb to him out of his mouth. Revelation 3.15, he says, 
I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Yes, as a nation and as individuals, we must trust God if we want to thrive and receive his blessings and his protection during the storms of our lives. But tell me something. As an individual, do you trust God? Or have you become so fearful in worldly circumstances or so fearful of the storm that you are personally in right now that your fear outweighs your trust? Well, let's see what happened to Peter, who at one point trusted in God, but then lost his trust due to fear. Matthew 14, 24 through 31 says, But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Do you see how when Peter put his trust in Jesus, he was able to walk on the water? But when the fear of the storm overtook him, Peter began to sink in the water as opposed to walking on it. And, you know, while Peter managed to trust God for a short period of time, he was unable to maintain his trust in God when his situation became frightening. But, you know, no matter where we are in our relationship with God, there is always room for our trust in him to grow. So how do we learn to trust God more than we do now? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to acknowledge him in all our ways. We need to acknowledge him in all of our ways. Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And think of it this way. Nobody likes to be ignored. So if, as a human being, you yourself want to be continually acknowledged by others, how much more do you think our Father in Heaven wants to be continually acknowledged by His children? Once again, Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Have you acknowledged or in other words, have you recognized God today? Did you know that by acknowledging him and recognizing him, it gives him the opportunity to give you advice or guidance and the opportunity to direct your paths? Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So, when we acknowledge God, he will give us advice or guidance. He will direct our paths. And you know, if it's one thing we all need, it's good advice 
someone to guide us and someone to direct our paths. After all, how often do we desire advice from each other? Oftentimes, we ask people for their advice on a particular subject in order to get the best instructions or recommendations for what they think we should or shouldn't be doing. Similarly, who better to seek advice from than God, the creator of the universe, the king of kings, our father in heaven? Who can better direct our paths than God? Once again, Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. In other words, in everything that you do, acknowledge God, and he will tell you which direction to go in. But know this one thing, that the path that our Father in heaven directs you to go down might be the opposite of the path that you would have chosen for yourself. Psalm 25, 4 says, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Well, why would the path that our Father in heaven directs you to go down be the opposite of the path that you would have chosen for yourself? Well, because the Bible says that God will always lead us down paths of righteousness through our faith in Jesus Christ. He will always lead us down paths of righteousness. Psalm 23, 3 says, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So if you're looking for direction in your life, should you ask a good friend saying, Make me know your ways, my good friend. Teach me your paths. No, not when you have the Holy Spirit within you. I mean, John 14, 16 through 17 says that God dwells with us and is in us. He dwells with us and is in us. John 14, 16 through 17 says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and in you. He dwells with you and in you. So why should we consult with and depend on others around us to give us advice or courage during the times when we're in need when the Holy Spirit of God dwells with us and in us. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So if we want God to direct our paths, then number one, we must first acknowledge him. And number two, we must be willing to walk on whatever righteous path he sends us on. Even if that means that we're going in the opposite direction of where we, in our minds, thought we should go. You see, God in his wisdom has made it simple for us because he made it so that he is everything that we need. Honestly, who else do we have but God? Psalm 73, 25 through 26 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I des desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So since God is our everything, then this means that we need more than just one time per week on Sunday mornings with him. And since God never slumbers or sleeps, this means that he's available to all of us all of the time. Psalm 121, 2 through 4 says, My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. 
Once again, Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. So we shouldn't just acknowledge our Father in heaven on Sunday mornings. We shouldn't just wait to consult with him and hear what he has to say on Sunday mornings. But knowing that he never slumbers and he never sleeps, we should be acknowledging him all the more because our communication with God is based on acknowledging him. That being said, what do your thoughts acknowledge first thing in the morning before you even open your eyes and get out of bed? Do your thoughts acknowledge trouble? Either your own personal trouble or the trouble of others or the trouble of the world? Is your mind awakened to trouble? Or is your mind awakened to the Lord? What is your mind in anticipation of? Are you in anticipation of Jesus Christ's return? Or are you in anticipation of the trouble at hand? So when the alarm clock rings, the first thing we should be doing before we even open our eyes and get out of bed in the morning is to acknowledge our Father in heaven. Why? Because Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's in all your ways, capital A, capital L, capital L, all your ways. Because it's not just once a year, once a month, once a week that we should be seeking guidance and wisdom from the Holy Spirit, saying, oh, that was so nice that the Holy Spirit put this or that on my heart to do or not to do. And isn't that so great the way it all worked out in my favor? We live in an evil time that requires us to spend a lot of time in God's presence. And we need to walk carefully and wisely throughout our days. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16 says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. And Galatians 5, 25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. But we cannot walk in the Spirit, as this scripture just told us, if we limit our communication with that same Holy Spirit. We can't go into a deep and intimate relationship with God, satisfied with only a moment here and there with God, just so that we can get through the tough situations in our lives. Besides, the Word of God says that we can enter the holy places of God without limitation without limitation. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. Therefore, in everything that we do, we should be acknowledging God and recognizing that he is there. Since by Jesus' death on the cross, we have access to the Holy of Holies. And as a result, we can have open communication with God. After all, don't we expect to have open communication in our close and intimate relationships? I mean, we would never settle for no communication with those that we love. No, when you love somebody, if they don't call you throughout the day, you say, hey, I haven't heard from you. What happened to you? Or I missed you today. Well, why do we feel that way about certain people? Because we love them and we cherish them. And so it's the same way with God. We as Christians should be feeling these feelings towards God throughout the day. We should be craving God. We should be acknowledging him, and not because the Bible tells us to do so, but because as the children of God, we should be craving it, just as we crave all of our other intimate relationships. Yes, as Christians, it is important for us to understand that we not only can, but we should 
be spending time with God, a lot of time with God. So this week, I challenge you to start letting your trust in God grow and to focus on Proverbs 3, 6 by acknowledging him in all of your ways this week so that God can show you which path you should take in your life right now. Amen.